So Rory Sutherland, thank you for being here. That's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to, to have a chat today. It looks like you're working from home at the moment. How have you found that over the last two years? Um, funnily enough, it's not just over the last two years, because about four or five years ago, um, somebody at Ogilvy uh, took out a Zoom contract for everybody. And I pretty rapidly noticed that this was this was the first video conferencing product which crossed Crappy Valley. In other words, you know, it's not that it's perfect. I'm sure there are further improvements we can all enjoy. But it got all of the basics fundamentally right. For example, it worked on the browser. It was cloud-based. Um, it, um, uh, it generally, okay, you would freeze occasionally, but when people froze, they generally recovered again. Whereas on previous video conferencing platforms, if something went wrong, you basically had to restart everything. And there are a, fa there are a combination of about 10 non-shit factors about Zoom which made me think that this was a kind of phase transition. This was actually, uh, you know, essentially it had crossed the chasm now uh, for business to business use. Um, obviously, kids were using things like FaceTime. I mean, I think Apple made an extraordinary mistake not making FaceTime multi-platform, but we'll park that. Um, and um, I suddenly realized, OK, we do need to reinvent the way we work around this. One of the things that had always irritated me was people saying, you know, I had to get in early to the office because I had a lot of email. Kind of went, you know, that's kind of missing the point of email. The point of email is you can do it anywhere. Um, and so what I did, interestingly, is I said, let's experiment with a degree of remote working. This is back in about 2018. And, uh, and what was interesting is I said, look, everybody, you know, feel free to work from home on Friday. And virtually nobody did. And it was only when I said, no, no, you're not quite understanding me. I actively want you to work from home. You're not burning reputational brownie points. But I think what happened is people automatically saw working from home as a concession. And therefore, they felt they were kind of burning presenteeist currency, reputational currency, every time they didn't show up in the office. And so as a result, they kind of held in reserve those days of flexible working for when it was in desperation. And I said, let, let, let's reframe this. Let's make this the default norm on Friday. And we'll all catch up at 9.30 and have a chat and we'll catch up at the end of the day. But, you know, we all have a certain amount of work that requires solitude or a certain amount of work that might be better performed, uh, you know, in peace and quiet. Um, and I always had a slight beef with the open plan office because I said it was neither one thing nor the other. It wasn't sociable and it wasn't solitude. And um, so, funny enough, I was pioneering it, and I probably worked from home one or two days a week. Uh, and I, I, what I managed to do, it took a bit of effort at the time because you had to partition your diary so that you had days where you were seeing people face to face and two days a week when you weren't. And I found it both incredibly productive and very agreeable, and it saved time and money. I live, I don't live very far from London, I'm just outside the M25. But I, I personally have spent the last four or five years as a bit of an evangelist saying, um, uh, you know, I don't know what the correct ratio of uh, co-location and remote working is, but it's not 100 nil. You know, whatever the correct ratio is, we need to find out what it is. And we can confidently say that the, the practice of people turning up every single day of the week to perform tasks where let's not forget, of course, um, something that happened in the last 10 to 15 years, or maybe the last 10 years, is quite often people's home technology is actually better than their work technology. You know, I'm sitting here at a ruddy great desk with a 55-inch 4K TV that's working as a monitor. I've got a second laptop on my desk. I've got a kind of SLR, actually technically not, but a mirrorless camera doing the job of a webcam. OK, so I've actually got better kit at home than I have in the office. And it's very difficult to do a video conference in the office because you've got to book a room. And actually, the Wi-Fi in an office isn't as good for video conferencing as home Wi-Fi is. So we've been um, you know, we've been performing this kind of experiment for about four years. And I'm still you know, I'm still not sure what the right ratio is. The best advice I've had is from Professor Paul Dolan, wonderful guy at the London School of Economics who he was a pupil of Daniel Kahneman's. He's a great expert in happiness, but also an expert in behavioral science. And his best advice, which I think is spot on, is go into the office one day more per week than you would do if left entirely to your own devices. So he says that, you know, whereas before there was undoubtedly a habituation bias uh, towards going into the office by default, even on days where, frankly, it served no function. 
But now there's probably a little bit of an idleness bias where people go, God, I could really do with the next hour catching up with my email. Let's not board a train. And as he said, probably one day a week, you'll go into the office slightly grudgingly and actually find you enjoyed it more, benefited more than you anticipated. And I think I think that's probably a pretty good... To be honest, I think the Dolan model of, of um, hybrid working is pretty much spot on. I think that's about right. So it's interesting that you say that there was, when you were pioneering remote working before it was a necessity, there was this kind of hesitancy because people weren't quite um, used to this new norm. Now, the last two years, I don't need to tell you this, have been a really interesting case study in behavioral science and people doing unexpected things. Um, as you've sat and observed this, what are the things about human behavior that have surprised you most in the past two years? Uh, oh, I, I actually, in the sense, it, ha it hasn't surprised me, but it's probably surprised other people, which is it's always worth noting that for most people, most of the time, two driving forces, the two really potent driving forces in behavior are habit and social copying. In other words, if you think if you think of the human brain having a kind of default mode, OK, rather like a, an automatic camera where, yes, you can tweak the aperture setting and the shutter priority and so forth. But most of the time we don't. We just put it on auto and snap away. And if you think of the brain by analogy with a camera in that way, um, two fairly safe decisions, if you're not sure what to do, are do what you've done before and do what everybody else does. That's not to say they're the perfect thing to do, but they're very unlikely to be catastrophic. OK, if lots and lots of people eat purple berries, you can reasonably assume that purple berries are safe to eat without any other knowledge of the berry. Likewise, if you've eaten purple berries a lot before and haven't had a bout of the shits or ended up dead, because by definition you're still alive by dint of the fact that you're contemplating whether to eat the berries or not. And if you've eaten those things before, then eating them again is probably a safe bet. And so I think we are calibrated to an extent, perfectly reasonably for evolutionary reasons, to, to use those two heuristics when in doubt. And so there are certain forms of behavioural change which will either take a, a large and slightly persistent habit-breaking disruption, before we'll adopt a new behaviour, or there's a collective disruption, which means that everybody else is doing something differently, which now provides me with both permission and an opportunity to do something differently myself. The other third thing is that absent those two, um, those two sort of forms of disruption, the individual disruption or the collective disruption, you will change your behaviour and people collectively will change their behaviour. It will just be quite slow. And I think it's probably fair to say we would have arrived at this level of flexible and remote working without the pandemic. I would have roughly guessed it would have taken eight or 10 years more. That's a very, very rough guess. I mean, you know, but funnily enough, the Department for Transport built into their models a decline in demand for road and rail use. But pre-pandemic, they had this decline effectively taking place roughly eight to 10 years ahead. I don't know whether they were waiting for new technology uh, or whether they saw the, the slow adoption as being effectively something that was delayed by simple psychological uh, stubbornness and reluctance to change. You know, it may, maybe they simply were reasonable enough to say, look, in 10 years time, someone's going to come up with a video conferencing metaverse product, which is going to be game changing in some respect. But equally, I mean, whatever you come up with in those things, don't assume. I mean, I, I, one, one advantage of being old, by the way, is you know this, because um, I, I'm old enough to remember when there was considerable hostility to the idea of a mobile phone, where it was a niche product. And, you know, I was the first of most of my friends to get one. And anyway, my friends weren't poor. They were kind of friends working in investment banks who didn't have mobile phones. And I got one. And I was... To be honest, thought slightly weird for owning one. You know, people would say, why would I want to make a phone call in the street? OK. And um, so it was interesting in that nearly everything. I mean, the car, you can go back, you know. I mean, I read a wonderful paper from the 1970s, which said, you know, I mean, it was a nasty thing. Cause it was written, but, you know, it said, you know, uh, you know, the problem, the, the problem with poorer people in Britain is that uh, when they gain more money, they're inclined to spend their money on pointless luxuries like washing machines. 
<laughs> I'm looking at this going, mate, <laughs> you know. <I> mean, <coughs> but, but I mean, that was... <coughs> There was a period where, you know, if you had a washing machine, you were either considered a bit of a weirdo or you were really rich and a bit flash. I mean, weird as it seems, I can dimly remember the tail end of that. You know, people going to people's homes and they had a mangle, OK, which was like two rollers and you squeezed your clothes between these two rollers and then the water ran off into a bucket. And so it's that is, I think, a really important thing because it's not well understood. There's a silly model um, because we can always make sense of the past, OK, this fools us into a belief that we can just as easily rationalise the future. And because we're very good at post-rationalising doesn't mean we're very good at pre-rationalising. And actually our ability, I think, to uh, predict um, is much, much worse than we think. More, moreover, I think a lot of very strange things become successful as a product of unexpected other things. You know, I mean, I mean, one of the interesting things I was, I was writing about recently is the extent to which the pandemic has accelerated a very high level of inventiveness in food. So you're having dark kitchens which only deliver. So I don't, in Brighton, there's a branch of Dishoom which doesn't have any tables, doesn't have any chairs. I don't know where it is. It might be in an industrial estate outside Brighton. But in London, Dishoom is a very high-end, fantastic Indian restaurant chain. I can recommend it to everybody, OK? It's in Covent Garden, it's in Shoreditch. Um, got a idea. There's one in Soho as well. And there's one in King's Cross. Uh, in Brighton, there's a Dishoom, but it doesn't open to the public. It simply serves food through delivery. Then we're starting to see businesses which really interest me, like Dish Patch, which is fairly in very interesting... Um, generally high-end-ish, but not exclusively, um, but very interesting, particularly either niche restaurant cuisines or restaurants that have a really extraordinary signature dish. Effectively preparing those things in batches, uh, chilling them, and then sending them out overnight for nationwide delivery. Now, you know, it's, only, it's only when those businesses, Gusto would be another example, you send the ingredients in the right ratio for people to cook pretty much restaurant quality food at home. And, and they fascinate me because in a way they're sectors which we should have predicted, right? You know, we should have said, you know, I mean, what in a way the takeaway meal is kind of done, right? Because it's not like my home lacks the facility for heating things up. All right. So why would I order something, then transport it home and then eat it in a slightly lukewarm state? It doesn't really make sense. Why, you know, why not send out the, you know, the basic ingredients and let people cook them? And so I think there's something really interesting there, because one thing that always fascinates me is we do seem to have extraordinary blind spots in that so many things that happen make perfect sense in retrospect but seem almost invisible to us in advance. And I, I just find that fascinating as a, as a facet of human perception. You know, and one of the things I've written about is, you know, 10 or 15 of the most extraordinary businesses of one kind or another. Um, if, you, if you imagine yourself back to a period before their existence, I think you've got to be reasonably a little bit old to do this, maybe. But, you know, the pop, Red Bull, Nespresso, bottled water, OK, I mean, all of those categories to me in 1970, you know, if you described them to me in the wrong way, would have struck me as a completely implausible um, and ridiculous business plan. You know, the Dyson vacuum cleaner. You know, if you'd said to me, no, I think there's a market for a, you know, £650 vacuum cleaner, I would have gone, yeah, there is, but it's not very big because most people wouldn't spend that kind of money and the people who do probably employ someone to clean the house so they don't actually use their own vacuum cleaner very much. And I would have said, I think, you know, I think you failed. To, and yet, what do I know? You know? Um, and so uh, this, I think, I think forces us to accept the basic Hayekian view as distinct from the economic, the conventional economic view, that capitalism is predominantly a discovery process. That it's actually an ongoing evolutionary process of market tested discovery as to what people what, what people want, really want, without necessarily being able to tell you um, what people actually want. And to some extent, in what form and under what presentation they're willing to buy it, 
because I think it's also a process of psychological discovery, not only a process of technological discovery. Because genuinely, I think you could have described, with the possible exception of Nespresso, I don't know. I'm just trying to think. But you, there are billion dollar businesses where if you describe the basic idea in advance, Five Guys is another one, okay? Uh, you know, a bit like McDonald's, only not quite as fancy inside, and the burgers cost 10 quid, you know? I would have gone, yeah, I'm not sure, you know. I mean, there's no economic logic by which you can describe the success of that entity. You can only really see it as a very really valuable discovery. I want to go back to something you said at the beginning of that answer, which interested me, which is that whilst most people, myself included, didn't see uh, these kind of wider trends coming because we're not looking through the paradigm that you have been for 35 years or whatever it is, um, you... I, I have to admit, the two things I did see coming, if I'm going to be smug, briefly, you know, I mean, there are a lot, you know, by the way, I've been wrong about a hell of a lot of shit. You know, I've got wildly excited about shit that didn't happen. The two things I did see coming were, one, the internet, okay, in the sense that I first used the internet in 1986, before there was a web. My brother was an astrophysicist, I was at the same university, and I used to blag time to go onto his mainframe account. And I pretty quickly got into Usenet, which were news groups, which presumably still exist. I've just, I, you know, I, I think you can probably still access news groups through your browser, whether they're, whether they've been archived or destroyed, I don't know. But this was basically a kind of, you know, it was a precursor to Reddit, I guess, purely textual, obviously. And I remember spending an afternoon in 1986. There was a guy in Connecticut who had a 1950s London taxi and needed to buy spare parts. Now, bear in mind, OK, there was no web then. So I had to go to uh, somewhere in the university where there was a London Yellow Pages. And I found a company which I think is called Man and Overton, which is the parts supplier for London taxis. And I actually rang them up and said, can you supply the fuel pump for a 1954? And they could, miraculously. So I went back to this guy in Connecticut and said, here's the phone number. These guys will sort you out. Now, bear in mind, there was no real way of that guy finding that shit out in 1986, sorry, in 1986. And I thought this is kind of really interesting because it's kind of collaborative and it's international and it's free and we can all basically be nice to each other. And I thought, OK, this has to be, and, and people will bear me out on this. I was spending the late 80s and early 90s burbling about this stuff before the web came along and caused it to enter the conversation. Um, uh, even in the early days, actually, in the uh, in the nineties, people to some extent got got on the internet not so much for the web but for email. Weirdly, okay. Um, uh, but I, you know, in in my defence, I saw that, and I also saw, I think, the fact that the underuse of video calling by two thousand and eighteen, the fact that we were we were still flying to Frankfurt for one hour meetings was essentially ridiculous and could only be explained by psychological factors uh, and I think there are several psych there's habit and there's uh, there's also there's also social pressure in this case which is that in a sense if um, if everybody else flies to Frankfurt to meet your prospective client and you're the guy who su su suggests a video call in 19 in, sorry in 2017 you looked like the lazy guy right Oh, you know, so the people from the other agencies all flew out to meet me, but the person from Ogilvy is just suggesting I talk on Skype. You know, you know, you can, you know, it's not really, even though it is obvious in terms of collective productivity, um, that we would be better off if everybody did it. At an individual level, nobody wanted to be the person putting the bell on the cat. And I think I did see that the, essentially the obstacles to this were not economic. They weren't to do with productivity. They were to do with the psychological hurdles, particularly the psychological hurdles that delay the adoption of network goods, which is that it's not enough for you to be individually enthous enthusiastic about a network technology. You need a collective enthusiasm before the technology actually delivers its benefits, or you need a massive pandemic. So just the last thing on this pandemic with the, uh, I guess, the foresight that you would gain for experience, Two questions, I guess they're one and the same. How do you rate how the government and their behavioural scientists did with communicating in the early part of the pandemic? And then also, let's say it's the 22nd of March, 2020, uh, some spad from Downing Street has got your uh, mobile number and they phone you up and they say, Rory, there's this big bloody virus coming. We need 70 million people to comply with staying at home and locking themselves away. What advice would you be giving them? How do you communicate that? 
Uh, it's interesting because what we actually saw is the, the interesting question is you do need some sort of legislation, right? And the reason you need legislation there isn't necessarily because you couldn't voluntarily uh, get everybody to behave fairly well. But patently, you know, you can't have one pub staying open and mopping up all the all, all the all the covid sceptics by being a really crowded, super spreading location. So you need universal consistency to a great extent, not not not, not in everything. But you also needed to prevent the social pressure of people bullying their employees to go into work um, simply because, you know, your boss was hyper macho or a COVID sceptic. Um, and so um, uh, I think um, I, I think it was very interesting because it was undoubtedly a case where you needed a mixture. You need, first of all, you needed speed of action. Um, interestingly, what was quite significant is the R rate, in fact, was in decline before they introduced lockdown. And that was because a significant enough body of people had decided to self-isolate through fear or through social uh, social concern, mostly fear, I suspect, um, before the lockdown was officially announced. And of course, it's worth noting there was a lot of anticipation of lockdown. So quite a lot of quite a lot of the behavior change um, was exerted by what people were expecting to happen. So we were expecting a lockdown. Well, in which case, why leave it to the last minute? I've got nothing absolutely critical. I'm not getting married in four days time. Uh, you know, wh why don't I just lock, lock down now? Um, and in defense, actually, it's very, very common for people to slag off various governments. But if you, I'm sorry, I'm gonna pause here because the phone's ringing. Sorry, that, that's it, the phone stopped ringing now. To be honest, if you look at the data, OK, one of the things is it's very easy to say this US state did well, this US state did badly at the aggregate level. But then you look at the disaggregated data from the individual states and you find that certain counties in a good state did particularly badly, certain counties in a bad state did particularly well. Um, actually, it's very, very difficult in a complex thing like this even with hindsight. Now, OK, I think it's fair to say they messed up on the on the care homes. Quite a few countries did, actually. And one of the things they also didn't realise about care homes is that many people work in multiple care homes. So there are many people who don't just work in one care home and then go home again. They actually do two shifts at two different places. And I think that was a complete coordination failure. Canada made the same mistake, interestingly. I think the United States did. I mean, I get a lot of people saying, you know, the government was responsible for X deaths. But A, you don't have the counterfactual, OK? And it's completely unfair to compare, for example, a place like London and the southeast of the UK, which has a huge amount of international connectivity with someone like Australia or New Zealand. It simply isn't a realistic, you know, if you're effectively the world's peninsula, as New Zealand is, you know, you do have both time and control over ports of entry uh, which is much much more difficult if you're kind of the world's crossroads and so it's not really healthy to compare country to country because as soon as you do it if you cut the data differently you find something different um, uh, one one other thing I would uh, I would say is that I think um, we probably I, I think we could also criticize the Chinese for allowing flights out of Wuhan to continue after they were being very strict with it, with travel within China itself, which which strikes me as something which was, you know, looking back on it. Um, I, I do think there's a slight problem, actually, in the sense that people are so frightened now of appearing xenophobic or nationalistic that we turn all criticism on ourselves. I genuinely think that's a problem of kind of, uh, you know, the social justice movement, which is it's become the sort of, it's become a sort of self-loathing movement. I mean, maybe maybe the invasion of yesterday will slightly encourage people to realise that actually, bizarrely, you know, people in Britain have it share much more than divides them when you're faced with a big external threat. But you know, I do think there is a, there is an interesting question, which is that, um, uh, you know, uh, the, there's an element to which what you might call correct opinion and journalistic opinion uh, has become uh, essentially ridiculously prone towards self-criticism. Uh, rather than asking questions of what happened elsewhere, because I think we, we if we if we're going to take a proper judgment on this, we need to be pretty pr pretty 
skeptical everywhere we look. I don't think we need to direct criticism in particular in one place. In truth, interesting question. First thing you had to do was buy for time. Will we will we ever know? This is a okay. This is a really important question. Will we ever know what we should have done? Uh, did we lock down a bit too late? Don't know. And let me explain why. Surely locking down early is better than locking down late. Not necessarily, because if you give no people advance warning of lockdown, a lot of people are going to be in the wrong place, and they're going to break the rule. You know, if I had been separated from my family, okay, and I heard that we were now entering lockdown. I'll be absolutely honest with you, I would have broken the rules to get home, you know, right? If I'd been separated from my wife and children, not knowing what was going to happen, I would have broken a lot of rules to go home. And so there, you know, there is this interesting thing that you have to legislate in a way that's actually feasible. There's no point in legislating in a way where most people can't obey your laws, because if you do that, um, then the laws effectively become disrespected and ineffectual. So I, I'm I'm just very un, I, I'm very unconfident. I, you know, I certainly think that there probably were alternative universes where we could have done better. I'm not sure with hindsight. Uh, okay, we can take the care homes one. I would also argue that um, uh, you know, some of the policing, where people were arrested for meeting outdoors for a cup of tea, we were also a bit slow. I think. To, oh yes, we were a bit slow. And this is actually you know let let's be honest here. Let's not make this all political. I think the medical fraternity in general, the scientific fraternity, were a bit slow, not necessarily to know, but to go public on the fact that this is airborne and therefore the risk out of doors. And I think we were also, I think you could also criticise the scientific fraternity for its scepticism or its unwillingness to commit on cloth masks. Uh, the, an unwillingness to commit on PPE equipment might be a sensible thing because you want that equipment in short supply to go to medical professionals who are definitely going to be exposed to COVID rather than ordinary members of the public who can avoid COVID um, if they wish. But the, the, the reluctance to make an, make, make an advisory comment around cloth masks will probably be seen as a mistake um, in retrospect or at least... A, 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 perhaps a demand for so much scientific purity of um, information that people are unwilling to make common sense judgments without perfect evidence, um, and I, you know, I think I think that will, um, uh, you know, and I think the airborne quality. But then, as I said, and I wrote about this in the Spectator. It's not that easy because if you said to people, "Hey, you can meet in the garden, but you can't meet indoors," that sounds like a fairly safe bit of advice until you realise that probably 40% of garden parties will turn into indoor parties when it gets a bit nippy in the evening. You know, if you could rely on people with ant-like conformity to finish their drink in somebody's garden and the second it gets a bit nippy, they get in their car and go home, you probably could have had more outdoor socialising in nice weather. But the problem is that it's not... It, 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 there are knock-on effects to everything you allow people to do. Yeah, so that's, that, that's the kind of interesting... In, 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 I mean, in a sense, you know, uh, you have to translate scientific findings into behavioural consequences. You can't completely give people the science. And this is where it gets complicated, OK? You can't completely give people the science because um, what people know will not cause them necessarily to act in a scientific manner. So I'll give you three facts about smoking, OK? Actually, no, I better not. Um, but OK, I'll give you one fact about smoking, because one of these facts is actually quite positive. So, you, don't, you know, OK, you can find that out scientifically, but you don't want people to know that smoking has certain, albeit very discreet benefits. OK, here's an interesting scientific fact. Do Doll, um, in his early and pioneering research into the link between smoking and lung cancer, more or less found statistically that if you smoke, but you quit at the age of 35, your life expectancy returns to normal. OK, now the question is, do you want people to know that? And we've got to ask that question, right? Because it's scientifically more or less, I think, validated, although I'm willing to be contradicted. Now, in one sense, no, you don't want that to be public knowledge because people in their 20s will go, well, hey, I've got another 10 years left. And people who are thinking about taking up smoking or worried about being addicted go, well, what the hell? You know, OK, I'll, I'll quit when I'm 35. On the other hand, it's a very important piece of information for 35 year old smokers to know, okay? Because 
it, what it says is a, a large number of people, I think, probably don't quit smoking because they think, well, the damage has already been done. In for a penny, in for a pound, might as well get hanged for a sheep as a lamb. You know, I've smoked for 15 years, too late now. You know, what the hell? And telling them, no, 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 it's not too late now. If you stop now, basically your life expectancy will return to that of someone who never smoked. And secondly, saying you're 35 tomorrow and every cigarette you have counts, right? From now on, every cigarette you have is irredeemably reducing your life expectancy. That's a very important bit of information to someone to know on their 35th birthday. So th this, is a, this is an interesting point where we get into behavioural science, which is that I think we might end up with a world where scientists are reluctant to actually give people the science because they're frightened of the behavioural consequences. OK, I think, you know, I think the lab leak theory was dismissed too hastily. I still don't know whether it's true or not, but it's an acceptable theory. OK, um, it, it's actually a plausible theory in many ways. OK, that was dismissed because, you know, people were frightened of spurring kind of, you know, hostile sentiment. OK. And so in a way, you know, if people react, if people responded to scientific facts with scientific behavior, if you like, um, well, maybe it wouldn't matter. OK, we could. But you do have this problem where government has to consider the science. The science is immensely important, but it's not an act of direct translation. And that question seems to me really fundamental because so much of um, so much of the model, so many of the models that we use to explain human behaviour are based effectively on the idea that people respond objectively to information. We don't, OK? We process information and it translates to behaviour, but it doesn't translate to behaviour in a direct way. I mean, I, one of the most interesting thought experiments is how would we drive differently if speed on a car speedometer was not given in miles per hour? Actually, we'd drive differently if the speed were given in kilometres per hour, by the way. Probably. If you just change your speedometer to kilometres, uh, we'd probably find that, you know, there was a significant change in driving patterns. If you change the speedometer to minutes per 10 miles, so that at 60 it will be 10 minutes, at, you know, OK. If you reversed it, OK, minutes per 10 miles, OK, um, I think people would drive in a significantly different way. Because you realise, now, there are two possibilities. Either people would go much faster because they'd realise in order to save a significant amount of time, I need to drive like a lunatic. Or they'd say, and this is the interesting thing, right? There are two ways you can respond to that. Or, as I did to some extent when I got a sat-nav, which, which sat-navs are very good at estimating arrival time. And what I noticed with my sat-nav is that if I drove at 80 on the motorway, it basically, I'd have to do that for a very long time to knock any meaningful time off my predicted arrival time so i basically got okay i've got cruise control i just set the cruise control at 72 or something on the motorway oh maybe it's 68 and i just sit there because i suddenly realized okay it isn't worth the risk and the cost and the uh, energy and efficiency um and you know the risk of getting arrested uh, i suppose at some level uh in order to, to arrive 2.3 minutes earlier it really is just isn't worth it it's a hell of a lot it's worth your time to avoid a traffic jam you can bet that OK, it's it's it makes a big, big difference to your arrival time if you can travel at 60 miles an hour, not 30. But actually, you know, I mean, this is possibly an argument against high speed, too, actually. That we go, ooh, it goes 180 miles an hour. Yeah, but OK. But I mean, so you arrive, you know, half an hour earlier. And in order to arrive earlier, by the way, it means the train's got to not stop anywhere in between because it can't afford to stop because it takes so long to build up momentum that the train becomes totally inefficient if you actually grind to a halt at an intermediate station. But the whole effing point of trains is they can stop at multiple locations. It's a whole bloody point of a train, really, right? And um, so, you know, but I mean, it interests me because I go, look, you know, you, you can drive like a lunatic and there's a risk, there's a, uh, hell, you know, there's a risk of accident, there's a risk of, um, uh, well, there's a cost, there's an environmental cost. And you go, OK, all the, and there's a cost in terms of stress and the amount of attention you have to pay. Rather than listening to a podcast, you're gripping the wheel with your white knuckles. And I kind of go, yeah, for three minutes, it's not worth it. But equally, other people might respond in completely the opposite way and go, God, I really need to welly it. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to be late. 
And so once you understand, even at the simplest level, facts translate into behaviour in context-sensitive and in, in highly individualised ways, you have to think about the world differently. It's not an optional extra, this shit. You know, it's actually a necessity. One of the interesting things, and I know that you've spoken about this in the past, is um, on Monday, actually, I got rid of my EV because I just couldn't make it work between Corby and South Wales. The infrastructure wasn't there. But do you think Oh, are you based in Wales? I am. As, so I, I'm based in South Wales from Northamptonshire. It's a very long story of how I arrived from one to the other. Are, are you Welsh? I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Uh, my business partner is. <laughs> oh, right, fantastic. Well. So I, yeah, I, I moved to Wales a few years ago. Um, but EVs, two things that are really interesting about them in my three or four month stint of driving one. The first is that it has completely changed my view of range in as much as in the diesel cars I had previously, 154 miles was fantastic news, right? I didn't need to go to a petrol station for a bloody lifetime and it was perfect. I get to 156 miles in the EV and I am sweaty and looking for the next charger and I think it's all about to run out. And secondly, and I'd love you to explain this one if you can, because it makes no sense to me, but it's behaviors that I have exhibited since having an EV. If I were to pull up at a petrol station, there is no way I'm starting a conversation with Carol, who's at pump seven. It just doesn't happen. That'd be seen as weird. No, 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 oh, no. Whereas EV, I call it electro dog. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, I, I, I don't mean that literally. But you literally bond with other EV owners and you're telling them that there's a 175 kilowatt charger just off the B479 at uh, Frampton Cotterill. You know, no, absolutely fantastic. I agree. Uh, and actually, they're a very diverse mix of people, surprisingly diverse, given that they're quite expensive to buy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always intrigued by the kind of people who have them and drive them. And you enjoy a very nice charge. I'd, I'd persevere with EV. I think you made a mistake getting rid of it because I think, by the way, a massive high-speed charging station has just opened in Swansea. Have you seen that? I haven't. That's interesting. My business partner has to, one. I hate, to tell you, I hate to tell you, after you've just got rid of your EV, if I go to ZapMap now and I go to their news blog, right, here we go, ZapMap. Oh, crikey, what's it doing here? Um, I will find it for you um, and then annoy the hell out of you by pointing out that... Um, I think it's Ionity. If I go to news, here we are, news latest. Um, Polestar working. Instavolt has just been acquired. It's very interesting. Oh, wow. Uh, where are we? Yes, GridServe opens the first EV charging hub in Wales. GridServe and Moto <laughs> have officially opened the first rapid EV charging hub in Wales at Swansea Services with 350 kilowatt DC ultra rapid charge points. So, uh, <laughs> I've played okay. myself. <laughs> You've played yourself. There you go. Um, um, so anyway, I only just noticed that this morning, I just to be um, instable. No, OK. Range anxiety, it goes away after about six months. OK, now I get the fact that if you very regularly do that very long drive. The other thing is, which is a bit weird, is that actually I always assumed that there'd be more problems with excess demand at charging stations than there is. Um, I, it still surprised me. At Christmas, I thought, OK, all the chargers are going to be full because everybody it's cold weather. Everybody's driving a long way. And yet, strangely, if you think about it, there weren't any stories about charger rage or, you know, there weren't any tabloid stories. OK, my personal take is in a year or two's time, OK, range anxiety is highly relevant if you're Canadian, American or Australian. OK, because you have to you have to now I'll, I'll give you the stats here. OK, in the UK, we've got 86,000 gas stations, petrol stations, OK, to serve a population of about 65, 70 million. OK, in the US, they have 116,000 gas stations because you need gas stations to serve a geography, not just a population. We do have petrol stations that serve a geography in kind of remote parts of Wales and the north of Scotland. But the rest of the time, our gas stations are serving a population. They're not serving a geography. We don't drive. We don't have those cases where where we've got to drive four hundred miles in a day, nearly as often as Americans do. Those, that awkward thing where it's too it, it's too short a distance to fly for Americans. Now Americans also don't have a train network, and they have one hundred and ten vo um, volts at home. So if you turn up at your grandmother's house and plug in, I mean you'll be there for a week before you can drive home again. Okay, in the UK you can plug into an ordinary domestic plug, and it's all right. Right. OK, you'll you know, overnight, you'll get yourself 70 miles, which will get you to the next DC charger 
Um, it's it, you know it's not it's not perfect. You know it would have been better if we'd we'd all had wonderful sort of seven kilowatt chargers. But it's all right. You know particularly if you arrive at eight. And also as Brits we're pissed after eight o'clock anyway, so we can't drive. So that gives us unlike Americans we get another four hours of charging. Okay. So actually in the UK uh, in a densely populated area, I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm, people in the Isle of Skye should disregard what I'm saying to some extent. Okay. Um, uh, or, you know, or, or people who live in Caithness might want to tune out for a moment. But in densely populated parts of the UK, countries like the Netherlands, similarly, um, it's not really, it, it will not be a relevant problem in a year or two. We've also got to factor in the fact that, of course, what people haven't quite figured out is you can put charging stations in, in literally for every place where you could build a gas station. There are a hundred places where you could install chargers. You know, if I went to the National Trust and said, "Hey, why don't you put a BP station next to, uh, you know, this Grade One listed country house, so people can fuel up, you know, and and, and visit your nice house while they're fueling up?" I think the National Trust would say, I, "To be absolutely honest, Rory, we'd prefer not to have a massive forecourt uh, outside. You could install electric car chargers unobtrusively." I had a guy come round to the house actually today from Connected Curb. Um, because we live in a in a, in a kind of a it's a large house split into apartments, and um, uh, so you know I, I I've survived for six months without even home charging because I'm waiting for the government subsidy to come in for uh, multi occupancy housing. And in, in a year's time, two years time, seriously, what did you have by the way in the electric car line? I had the Volkswagen ID three, which is up there range wise, and even then I was struggling. Hold on, hold on you can easily get from Corby to. Um, uh, so there's a... Is there a huge... By the way, is there a huge rivalry between Corby and Kettering? I'm not making this up, <laughs> this am is, I? This is the greatest trivia that I didn't expect you to know. There is a... There's an interesting ge geopolitical divide because the people from Kettering almost anchor south because it's close to London and the people from Corby from the steelworks are very Scottish and so there's this almost physical border between the two. It's extraordinary because someone... I, I read in a book, someone had done some research in Corby Library... And it said to the librarian in Corby, you know, I have to say, you've been extraordinarily helpful and I'm very, very grateful to you for everything you've done. And her reply was, yes, well, we're not like those bastards in Kettering. <laughs> and this chap had no experience of the Kettering Public Library uh -huh. and didn't understand what the origin of this animus was. How extraordinary. I can't explain it, but it's, so it, it's a real thing. Yeah, Mon Monmouth and the Forest of Dean had a similar kind of mutual horror. <laughs> yeah, when I, um, when I was growing up. Fascinating. But but no, I mean, you can make it from Corby to Swansea, can't you? On a on a full charge? Not in this weather, and I think I picked up the car at the wrong time. Ah. So if I if ah, I could have grinned and bared it for a few months, I probably would have been okay. But it's just the the stress and the three hour journey turning into a five and a half hour journey, and then arriving in Wales with thirty miles, and then because of where our office is, there's not even a charge nearby. It's either. 20 minutes north or 20 minutes south from here just to charge. It was just a faff. Um, I've got two questions I want to try and fit in in six minutes. Of course, yes. So, I've, I've got a hard stop, unfortunately, at one. So, yeah, that's super. I'm sure we can fly over the first. And then the second is a very important question about Tinder. So I must ask it. Um, so the petrol prices right now really interest me from an irrationality point of view. Because in the months after Brexit, when they were climbing up, people would be saying, oh, those bloody bastards who take that box, they're making my fuel £1.10 a litre. And then recently with supply chains and coronavirus, the price has shot up to maybe 145 a litre. And people were kind of okay with that. Oh, you know, it's, it's something we can't control, so that's okay. And now with this Putin stuff, it's almost like it's your patriotic duty in two weeks' time to go and pay 170 a litre just because of those bloody Russians. What is it about pricing that makes us happy to pay more when the context is different? Oh um, yeah, that, that, I mean, that that's a very important uh, finding, which is we don't. I mean, mainstream economics just thinks we just care about um, uh, what something is and how much it costs. In other words, how much utility will I derive from this, and how much money do I have to sacrifice? We interpret. We're a social species, so we interpret pricing through the lens of meaning. And if we feel we're being gouged, for example. We will be resentful um, or if we feel we're deriving less value from it than someone else who pays the same price, we will be less comfortable with the transaction. An example of that was would be it would probably pay me to subscribe to the Financial Times. OK, but I don't work in banking. I work in advertising and 80 percent of the 20 percent of the content of the Financial Times, I'm sure, is utterly fantastic, although it's tediously Remainer in its um, 
uh, in its views and it would annoy me. But nonetheless, I'm sure that 20% of the content is well worth the subscription price. But I would feel that I'm paying effectively for a huge host of articles on the prospect for central banking reform in Paraguay, okay, which are of zero interest to me. And I, I equally would resent you have to charge Brits less for the New York Times than you charge Americans. Because they do feel that, look, you know, New York restaurant reviews just aren't that relevant to me most of the time. Um, and so we, we effectively, when we decide what to pay for something, we do second, we do actually consider the point of view of the seller. It isn't a one way, um, it isn't a one way assessment of utility cost. We actually ask questions about, you know, uh, what does this say about the person selling it, for example, and. Um, uh, you know, so price gouging. R Richard Thaler wrote a very good piece about this in Misbehaving. About a, ski he he went to a ski resort and said, "Look, you're overbooked in at Christmas and Easter, and you're underbooked the rest of the year. Why don't you just very simple economic solution? You charge much more at Christmas and Easter and less the rest of the year. You know, simple yield management." And the answer there was very simple, which was, "Yeah, but if you gouge them at Christmas, they don't come back in March." And uh, so, you know, there's an understanding that most transactions take place actually within a wider context of consideration. Every, and, and economics achieves its mathematical neatness by assuming everything's a one-shot game. And emphatically isn't. If you, get, if you price gouge people, you run the risk of resentment. It's one of the reasons, you know, Ocado had to make a very interesting decision during the pandemic, which is they basically gave preferential slots to, to, to customers who are long-standing customers. Now, you know, a pure economist working for Ricardo would just go put up the price of everything and, and acquire all, and actually treat new customers better than old ones, okay? Um, and Ocado did, the, you know, did, did neither of those two things because they understand that they operate within a wider context of consideration. And then my final question on Tinder, if anybody thinks I was gonna sit here with somebody who has studied and uh, written direct response, understood the power of language and behaviour for so long and not ask how to write the perfect Tinder bio, they're wrong. So in 60 seconds, what advice do you have for me to write a really great Tinder bio? Well, first of all, targeting. Um, and I'm Welsh in part, so I turn on Tinder in Swansea and turn it off in Corby, but that's because <laughs> because the Sw which do you do? I've got to ask you that question. Okay, where are you more active on Tinder in Swansea or in Corby? It has to be in Wales, and it's because you. I don't like seeing people I know on Tinder, and I know more people in Corby. <clears throat> so you don't want to bump ah interesting so you've got the benefit the cloak of anonymity <laughs> um i don't i have no experience of that because as someone who basically you know got got married before these things existed i'm of that generation who feels like we caught the last helicopter out of saigon <laughs> dating wise you know we escaped this fairly nightmarish looking um situation um uh, it depends entirely of course on what you want and that's the vital thing because my suspicion is that the long-term relationship message will be very, very dramatically different from the short-term fling message. Because in a sense, you know, what you're looking for, <coughs> as someone said, you know, uh, the, the perfect job advertisement has a very low response rate. It has one response and that person is the perfect candidate. Okay. Now, you know, there is that and there is playing the numbers. And I would guess that the approach you want differs according to what your intention is. I mean, that's definitely food for thought. I'll, um, I'll feedback in a few months on how my trying to get one response goes, because I feel like I'm at the age where we, we need to be aiming for one and not 50. Um, right. Um, uh, so um, I've, I've probably done a massive disservice to the population of Corby. I'm sure they're absolutely <laughs> wonderful people. Um, but... Um, but no, it's an interesting one. I mean, there are undoubtedly um, uh, uh, both the photograph and the wording. It's an extraordinary case because essentially everything is being second guessed. It's, it's done very largely through inference. And so the trick is to get the message across obliquely, not directly. What you're trying to say on a Tinder ad, I imagine I've never been on the bloody thing and my wife's next door, so even <laughs> if I had, I wouldn't admit it, okay? Um, uh, uh, okay, uh, I'm, I'm genuinely, I've never downloaded it, I've never seen it. What you have to do is you've got to say things which you can't say directly. And that's why it's an exercise in obliquity, because you can't say rich, highly attractive, very funny man, 
because everybody would say that, right? So what you've got to do is find a way of, con or whatever, whatever it is you think is desirable in Swansea, I have no <laughs> idea. Um, so what you've got to do is find a way of, of, of conveying attractiveness, but in an oblique way. And that might involve, by the way, the opposite of a good idea. It might involve a chunk of self-deprecation. You know, it might, you know, it might involve, you know, inverse humour. You know, um, uh, but uh, it, 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 again, um, it, one thing that probably makes sense is to test different approaches. And I, I'm intrigued to know whether people on Tinder actually kind of test regularly. They, does Tinder allow A-B split tests? It doesn't, but that doesn't stop me. That doesn't stop me. <laughs> Right, so you can only do that chronologically, because yes. I think A-B testing on Tinder would be utterly fascinating. But do read books on it for what works, because it's weirdly surprising. I, I've got a dash now, but it's weirdly surprising. This has been an absolute joy. Let me know when it goes out, and I can't wait to hear it. Amazing. Rory, thank you so much. Have a good day.